we can do all of this. It's not like there's there isn't anybody riding unicorns around and waving magic wands and making this stuff happen. <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined by Barrett Scher from CinemaSins. Hello. And today we have a very special guest, uh, the uh, director of an upcoming movie called Archive, Gavin Rothery, is here. Yeah. And hello. Um, and uh, you know the the thing that I was uh, going through when I when I was watching this movie was certain elements of it reminded me of Duncan Jones's Moon, and. I noticed that you were a conceptual designer on Moon. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly not a coincidence. Um, yeah, myself and Duncan, um, we were actually living together in a, uh, in a um, we were flat sharing. We were flat buddies for like 10 years before Moon. And wow. we, just, we worked on everything together. So we met when he was at, um, still at film school. And I was working in a games company wanting to be a, a CG artist. and Well, I was a CG artist, but wanting to do, you know, you're always trying to do more. You're always trying to do kind of better work. And this is back in like the mid 90s. And so, um, yeah, we just became friends and just started working together on things. And, you know, he was he was going through the whole process of just graduating film school. So he's trying to get like, you know, music videos, commercial work, things like that. And we just worked together on everything. I was like the kind of art side of his brain, really. And he'd be the writer and I'd do all the art stuff and design it. And that got me into doing visual effects. And I just basically do all the visual stuff. And it was just a pair of us working at home. And, you know, we were trying to, we were, the ultimate goal was to make a film. And we, it took us like 10 years to get Moon made. And we had a couple of false starts along the way. But eventually, after 10 years of grinding and grinding and grinding, we eventually got to make Moon. Wow. So... Yeah, I mean, the whole thing came, the genesis of the whole film was just like me and him really in our flat having cups of tea talking about what we could do that would be a cool film. And um, <laughs> yeah, so me as the as the, like the sort of arty one, if you like, you know, I've got my, he's in his bedroom writing, I'm in my bedroom with my PC, Photoshop up and drawing, 3D work, just conceptualizing stuff. Um, and we just kind of like went backwards and forwards. It was a little bit frustrating working on Moon, probably more so for everybody else rather than for me, because my kind of role crossed into all these areas because we worked as like a kind of a creative team. So I, my role wasn't really clearly defined, and it's not like I sort of interviewed for a job or anything to work on Moon. It was just like the pair of us as mates going, let's make a film. Hey, I'm going to do a lot of graphic design and chuck that on there. You go, stick that on there. That'll look cool. Hey, what about if he did this in the story? That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? And it was all, it was that. You know, that's that's where it came from. <laughs> yeah. Well, we love that movie, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that, that whole thing, I've never worked on anything as hard on my li- in my life as I had on Moon until I did archive. So <laughs> hopefully that's gonna there's gonna be some fruit in there for if you like to moon, hopefully archive's gonna have something that you like. Yeah. Um the, there is a, a there seems to be in, in the, the work that I've seen you credited on and, and I also watched your short Last Man, The Last Man, um uh, on YouTube, which has ten million views. Uh that must wow. have been pretty Congrats. exciting for you uh, uh making that short and having it uh, be watched so widely. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a funny one because, you know, The Last Man's a post-apocalyptic piece, mm-hmm. and it's about The Last Man. And, you know, who'd have thought people are into that in these in these day and age? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so what did, how, did, uh, how did your experiences on these two movies uh, lead, uh, lead into Archive? Uh, uh, did you learn a lot of things on those, on those couple of movies, or did you have to learn a whole bunch of new things for this, for your feature debut? There's always more to learn, but the thing that gave me the confidence to try and do Archive in the first place was the experience I'd picked up on Moon, because I was so like, heavily involved in everything that was going on it demystified the whole process for me. And we were making Moon up as we went along, but being right there with Duncan as we went through the whole process, 
you know, I saw the whole thing and was actively involved in most of it. And so coming off the back end of it, I was like, well, I might just have a go at this myself. When we finished Moon, Duncan moved over to LA, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had just met um, a lovely girl that I was very interested in, and so I didn't move to LA. <laughs> it's always the story, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, her fault, it's chick's fault. So yeah, I am... Um, I stayed in London, and now that lovely lady has um, given me a lovely child who's in archive. Oh, oh, oh really? Oh, that's yeah. awesome! <laughs> yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's really cool. Getting it started <laughs> early. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, the, I mean, the whole thing was like, I'm, I'm, you know, what these things are like. It's like what I have this kind of deal with myself, which is like, what am I, what am I doing? Because I work freelance, right? So I'm a freelance artist, work in the games industry, done all kinds of bits and pieces all over the place. I've had a really kind of strange career that's taken me all over the place. And when it comes to kind of doing my own thing, I've always got this kind of deal with myself, which is like, whatever I'm doing at any point, I could just stop and go and sit in the garden and have a sandwich. I could just chuck it all in, give it up, and go and have a sandwich. And so my whole kind of deal with myself is, like, whatever I'm doing is, like, at any point, I'm always asking myself, like, do you want to go and have that sandwich now? And that's, weirdly, that's the thing that drives me, because whenever I think about that sandwich, it makes me, like, properly, like, get off my ass and get something done. (laughs) (laughs) It's weird. I can't quite explain it. It's almost like, you know, not it's not giving up, I I guess, really, is what it is, but... For some reason, inside my head, the whole thing's framed around just having a sandwich and sitting in the garden and not caring, because I know that I could like never really do that. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, this uh, this movie stars Theo James, who a lot of people rec- will probably recognize from the Divergent ser- series. He's also a producer on the movie. How did you uh, How did you uh, hook up with him? We had um, the good fortune to cross into the orbit of Theo's agent who is with WME. Um, yeah, she, she hooked us up. She put us together. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and of course he's British and can do a perfect American accent, which he's annoys good. me to no end. <laughs> how good your people are with doing American accents. <laughs> yeah. Theo's, Theo's great with the accents. Um, that was a, it was really fun when, um, we were talking about that at the beginning because I had the same thing with Stacey Martin as well. You know, we're all talking about accents. How do you want to do it? And so what, yeah, I was, I was having, having them asking me, you know, what do you think? And I was like, well, what, what can you do? Like, you know, I've, I've heard Theo's American accent before and it's great, but he does a thing which is, it's a weird one. Uh, one of my favorite old time films is Southern Comfort. And huh. is it Keith Carradine in that? He's got this fantastic kind of drawly accent mm-hmm. and, I saw a play that Theo did on stage called Sex with Strangers. Um, when we were kind of falling into each other's orbit, I was um, checking him out a bit, and I saw some of his theatre work, which is fantastic. Um, and he had this, he just really reminded me of, um, he reminded me of um, Carradine in Southern Comfort, and I oh, just wow. loved it. I thought it was fantastic. So I just asked him to do that, and he just brought it in spades. He's, <laughs> a, he's, he's a tricky one, Theo, because he's one of those people it's quite hard to hang around with because, you know, He's like super talented and super handsome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. It's frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have the same problem with Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of amazing we haven't seen more of this guy. I mean, uh, I think the biggest high high profile thing that I've seen. Uh, hit, uh, like he's working on is that Castlevania series that's on Netflix, but that's just the voice work. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's interesting. It, it, this guy is is really good. He's 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 uh, primed for a breakout at some point. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I hope it's with this. To be honest, I mean, he did stick with us for like two years whilst we got well, over two years whilst we got the film together. So, I mean, feels like a you know super important part of the puzzle like a core reason this film even got made so normally when you're um when you're putting a film together and you're casting you can get hold of people you can get into their orbit and you can talk to them but you've always got like a little window that you have to work within and usually that's the thing that pushes a project to get made because you'll secure talent they've got a window that they can work in and then that forces the money to get involved because if they don't put the money in at that time there's no film mm-hmm. they always great mm-hmm. and he, he waited for like it was over two years whilst we got everything together superb yeah wow. and he's he's got a lot of responsibility in this movie on screen 
you know, he, he carries the whole movie, right? I mean, he's in yeah. almost every scene. Uh, and uh, you can see this, this character arc building throughout, uh, throughout his interactions with his creations, um, how he interacts with them very differently um, and, uh, and how it all un I, I won't say unraveled. We'll keep this spoiler free, by the way. Um, how, how it, how it exacerbates itself near the end. Uh, got one of the best final expressions, one of the most amazing uh, final shots, really, that I've seen in a long time. And uh, you can really see that building through his performance, um, especially having that amount of responsibility. I really appreciate that. I mean, I was really trying to create um, a piece with Archive, which had value in more than one watch. And one of the things that I was very keen to do was to have a strong ending. So there's a lot of attention put on the ending of the film to try and get it right. So it's really gratifying to hear that that came across. Well, it was it was really gratifying to watch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I always get sucked into these these types of movies, and uh, and uh, you know you you have this. Um, you know, we we mentioned Moon. We you're obviously going to think of Ex Machina during this as well. Um, uh, the uh, the there's there's just something about. I don't know. Do you think that sci-fi is getting closer and closer to being more uh, accessible? Like it's not all about aliens anymore. It's a, it's like the, it's, it feels like the stuff that science fiction is now is within reach. Whereas back in the fifties, science fiction seemed like it was, it was many years away. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is that sort of what you, what you're feeling on science fiction these days, or is it, do you have a different outlook on it? Well, I mean, my take on it is that I like science fiction where I can understand and appreciate the stakes. So when I was writing Archive, when I was putting the story together, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted a film which had stakes that everybody that was watching it would be able to kind of hook onto. So as far as themes go, I decided to try and put a story together based around the themes of love and death, because those are things that are going to touch everybody's life in, in some form or another. So I wanted to write a story about love and death. And the original idea for the story that I had back in 2011, it was a note that I had in my iPhone. Because if I ever have any thoughts that I think are of value, I always put them in my phone and my iPhone as notes. Hmm. I have a note back from, um, I think it's October 2011, thereabouts. And it was an idea for a, um, a, 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 the creation of an AI machine, which is human equivalent, like it's smart. And the idea I had, like the nub of an idea, was that this machine, um, as soon as it got turned on and became sentient, it would basically kind of look around the room and then kill itself. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was that was the original idea. I thought that was really interesting, the idea that a machine could become so sophisticated it, it just wouldn't want to live. <laughs> well, you certainly uh, you certainly gave this uh, machine an entrance um, when it when it when <laughs> when it first uh, comes to life. There's no doubt that anybody will uh, will for, nobody's going to forget that. Uh, <laughs> it is it is a it is a great scene, and again, we don't want to spoil, but it's a, it's a fantastic. Uh, you know, it's something that you don't expect uh, from uh, these type of things. You always ex you know you when you look at things like a machine, then you expect them to act like a machine. So, um, uh, it, uh, that's an, uh, that was a fascinating pro that, that, uh, the effects process must've been pretty fascinating on this as well. How much of this is Stacy Martin in makeup, at, at, especially at the beginning and how much of it is just visual effects? Well, most of it's practical really, because we didn't have a massive budget. Like this is a small film, but with big ambition, Mm -hmm. And we were very careful which battles to get, you know, where to where to spend the money and which battles to fight. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really, the the thing that I wanted was performance driving everything, which is why the J one and J two robots are costumes and there's people inside them. And oh, nice. J3, oh wow, didn't know that. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> oh right, did you not realize that? That's I cool. did not. I did not. I could just be uh, being dumb, but you did a really good job. No, oh, they, right. they they do because you can tell. And I'm sorry to interrupt your, your what you were saying, but uh, you can tell there's humanistic characteristics of their movement. Uh, each being, you know, according to their quote age. 
Um, so that doesn't surprise me, but it's very, very cool. <laughs> I don't know if I would have guessed that. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. That's certain. brilliant. I really appreciate that. Um, but with, with them, sorry, going back to J3, um, Stacey Martin, yeah, the, the VFX work was, um, she's kind of in, she's in two, well, she's kind of in three stages, really. So um, when we first see her, there's a very clear, sorry, I'm going to get into a little bit of spoilers now, but you, if you're interested in seeing the film, you'll have seen this from the trailer anyway, probably. But she has her legs removed and she's attached to a robotic arm and she's got like robotic skin. So that was Stacy. It was all, it was all really kind of um, low down and dirty VFX because that's all we could afford. <laughs> uh, so she's just standing there with a pair of green trousers on. And then oh, wow. in post, we took the trousers, removed them, we took the trousers off in post. And right, um, right, right. we put like a little kind of plug module in, like the robotic uh, machine hips in there. And it's super effective. I mean, it looks great on screen, but it's really straightforward what we did. And we were careful what we did with the camera too. We weren't moving the camera too much. So, you know, it was very um, straightforward work to do. Um, then when we see her um, having her legs applied later on in the film that was all cg stuff in the tank but there's only a few shots of that that's all done very quickly yeah um and then the final version of j3 uh, when she has her skin and legs complete is excuse me probably the the most straightforward of all of the visual effects which is skin painting and um layered she had like transfers that she applied to her skin and we had to shave some of her um some of her kind of peachy um skin hair off in places to get those to stick on and we did some work in post as well to, to lighten her skin as well, because I wanted her to be like completely white because the idea is like she's a ghost. And so mm -hmm. I wanted her to just be like completely white and like a bit creepy looking in places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely got that, that effect down for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's cool though, isn't she, Stacey? She's, oh. she, I was so happy with what she did. I thought she's wonderful. Oh, she's fantastic. Um, uh, that's, uh, it, it uh, goes to the heart of what I've been seeing recently. Uh, I don't know if you would have done it another way if you had had a bigger effect, uh, effects budget, but uh, it seems to be the the best way to go. At least it's it's it draws me in more when the performance matters more than the effects. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is something that they were you know this is something that I, I heard in a lot of the behind the scenes stuff on on Ex Machina was that they were talking about how Alicia Vikander her performance is so good that, you know, that the effects are just kind of a secondary thing. I feel the exact same way about Stacey Martin in this movie. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I guess really what we're doing is a, well, like, you know, you become like a, a little filmmaking team and I think it all comes from the script. Like if everybody believes in the script and everybody gets into it, the whole, the effects thing just becomes a whole bunch of work to be done afterwards. And, you know, cross-checking and clearances with the supervisor whilst you're moving forwards to make sure you're not doing anything too crazy. But, mm -hmm. you know, with my background in VFX anyway, you know, that kind of stuff's like second nature to me, so it's all pretty straightforward. <laughs> That's the easy part. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, kind of, yeah, really. You know, it's, it's the kind of stuff where, you know, I know if there's going to be a problem and I know if I'm doing something that's going to be expensive. Right. I was, uh, I was wondering because this base – functions almost as a character in this movie. Um, how much of this was on location? How much of this was set? Um, clearly the, the, the bridge itself, myself having a fear of heights is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, but the scenery is just lush and gorgeous in, in this movie. So where did you shoot it? Uh, how much was set work? Well, everything that you see inside was a set. So we built one set, so we shot the film in late 2018 in Hungary. So at the moment, I mean, well, right now, nothing's getting filmed anywhere. But prior to the whole pandemic business, um, if you're in the business of trying to mount uh, like an independent film, I guess any independent film, really, that requires studio space, it's quite likely excuse me, that you'll be out of luck because like Netflix and Amazon Studios have just come in and they've just block booked everything. Hmm. So so what's happening is people are shooting in warehouses and huh. that's what we did. We took over a warehouse um, in a place called Alshanemedi, which was about an hour's drive outside of Hungary. Huh. So we use Hungary for all of our um, accommodation and, you know, nights out and stuff whenever we got one of those. And we just jumped in a minibus and drove out into the Hungarian countryside to a remote warehouse. 
<laughs> which we blacked out and soundproofed, and we shot in there. So wow. we had the whole house and laboratory was one contiguous set, the house, the garage, the robotics lab, all of that stuff, the corridor, that was all one big set. And that, like, filled the um, the warehouse. And then the exterior stuff, we had the stuff in the forest, which was that was shot in Hungary too. We had a, a beautiful forest that we found up on location. And, mm. um, sorry, the location was up, up a mountain. And... In the film, you'll see that it's it's quite snowy in the in the um, in the film. It actually mm. snowed. It started to snow when we were driving out there, and we weren't expecting it. And by the time we were ready to shoot, everything was covered in like a, a film of snow. <laughs> and you know, it was funny because I remember people looking at me saying, like, you know, what do you want to do? And, and I was just thinking, like, what do you mean? Like, first, yeah, this... of all, first of all, we're here. We're shooting a film. <laughs> Secondly, this is awesome and beautiful. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was how the snow ended up in the film. So the thing is, we had two days up that mountain. And, and after the first day, we were, you know, I was like, oh, my God, I hope the snow's there in the morning when we go back. And fortunately, it was. So we managed to get all the forest stuff with the snow, which was a big win. Wow. And then when we got into post, it complicated things because then everything else had to be snowy or to have some degree of snow in there. Mm. So it just it complicated things on the back end. But, you know, when you're doing these things, you've just got to have confidence in the moment and just plow forward. So um, the actual house itself, that is a real location, which uh, what happened, we got in the edit. And originally the house is going to be done as full CG. But, um, you know, our budget was just getting stretched and broken all over the place in post. It was a real battle to – films like this are hard. You know, when, when you've got a small budget and, and a lot of ambition, you know, it's hard and you, your battles shift when you get into post. You are, yeah, Invariably, you have, to, you have to give things up, basically. So I had to give a couple of things up, and I was just trying to lighten the post wherever I could. So instead of doing a full CG environment, I uh, – the film set in Japan – and I had my DJI drone. I've got a little DJI Mavic Pro 2, which I had out with me. I had, it, I had this thing in my, um, in my backpack constantly whilst I was shooting. And I kept pulling it out and just putting it up and grabbing some footage whilst we're out and about. And that became all the aerial stuff. That was like huh. me just getting the drone up whilst everybody's having lunch and stuff and just grabbing like 20 minutes of snowy forest flyovers or this or that or just anything I could really. I remember walking it through the forest and um, I was using it as like a, um, a dolly. I just had it in front of me about three feet off the ground, and I was just kind of gently pushing it in and out of the trees. And all that stuff ended up in the film. And oh, wow. um, it's just bonus stuff. It's Essentially, it was B-roll that I was just grabbing um, whilst I could. But the, the Mavic Pro 2 is good because it's got a Hasselblad camera on with um, a, the color sensor that gets 10 bits of um, 10 bit color depth. So it's more, it's more than just your sort of 8-bit YouTube drone footage. It's got some, mm. you know, you can grade it. So that was all good. And then, yeah, we needed a – so, sorry, going back to the house, um, to save money in building a CG environment, which we, we just ultimately would never have got that. Um, my amazing editor, Adam Biskupski, found a place out in Norway, which was a plateau over a waterfall in the middle of nowhere in a place called Manafossen in Norway. <laughs> and we found it, Adam found it on a tourist video and he showed it to me and I was like, because uh, originally my plan was to go out to Iceland because they've mm. got the big waterfalls in Iceland. And, mm -hmm. you know, might have come out a little bit prometheus but I was like, that's where, the, that's where the waterfalls are. And I was watching the weather calendar to try and track the snow. Mm. And basically I was just sat there with, you know, on the... Um, the, the flight's website, my finger over the buy flight button. As soon as the weather map says it's snowy, it's like, oh! It would have been like me and my producer and editor just, you know, we would have been out in, um, you know, in Iceland. But as you would have it, when we were editing this in, in sort of February and March, the snow was receding. And so we are watching the weather thing going, come on, just give us a weekend of bad weather. Just give us some terrible weather and we're out there. And it didn't snow. So looking when when Adam found this um, found this waterfall in Norway, I was like, well, let's just go there. We'll go there. We'll shoot it, and we'll just do what we can. So my awesome producer Philip Hurd, um, editor Adam Biskupski, and myself uh, flew out to Norway. Hired, it was all done so cheaply. Like we just got like the cheapest hotel we could find, hired a car. Um, me and Adam both took our drones out there, and we were just shooting. We were just flying the drones till the batteries were dead. Going back to the hotel, charging them up again, back out again. You know, so we're out there with like four batteries each. So we've got, you know, we've got like two hours of flight time and we were just driving all over 
the sort of provincial area of Norway around Manafossen. We were there for wow. three days. But to be honest, we were there for three days and we got what we needed in the first half a day because Manafossen was that perfect. Wow. So, yeah, and another really thing, cool thing that was happening around that time is we had um, Stephen Price, who was doing the music. What, oh, speak- a great, great music, by the way, in this. Yeah. I had, I had, I had uh, I looked him up and I saw that he had done a, quite a few that I that I enjoy very much. So uh, good, good on you getting him. <laughs> well, you know, he actually, um, he actually. Well, what happened was I had a friend who knew him who mentioned um, Archive, and it turned out it was the kind of thing he was looking for. So he actually asked me if I, he could do it, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. So, <laughs> yeah, honestly, Stephen Price, I yeah, I can't, I, I don't even know where to start with that guy. He's such a wonderful dude. Yeah, um, absolutely. He's just brilliant. But we got his first drop of music whilst we were driving around Norway. So there was me, producer and editor, having the best time ever in Norway, just, you know, three uh, three filmmaker nerds driving around beautiful scenery in a hired car, flying drones. And we, we had about an hour's drive to a waterfall that we'd found that we were just trying on spec in case it was any good. And um, we were um, playing Stephen's first music drop in the car over the car stereo whilst we were driving. Honestly, it was so, it was so good. It was like this perfect, like, because it felt like really Indian, like low key, because it was just three of us. But the work that was getting done was at such a high level, like, you know, Stephen Price <laughs> score, you know. But at the same time, it had that kind of film student fun vibe to it. Yeah. Really good. I, one note that I had was not only the score itself, but the sound in, in this movie is it plays a big role. You know, the, the sound that the the box makes when there's there's a a transmission or something like that. Mm. The sound that the, um, the, the, the creations make the J one, the J two, uh, is very, is very unique. And the sound that the, the car makes even oh, is very uh, yeah. blade runner. <laughs> you know? That it's car sound. Awesome. The first time I heard that car sound as a, as a, as a filmmaker, <clears throat> excuse me, things like this are like, it feels like you've been given presents. It feels like you're <laughs> winning prizes. We worked with a chap called Brian Gilligan, who was our sound designer, who's just absolutely brilliant. Um, he works at um, LipSync in London, in Soho. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the sound design is something that I always love because it's it's a point in filmmaking where you get to really put something back. Because usually when you're filmmaking, like you always give things up and things aren't quite coming out as cool as you liked or as big as you liked or as nice as you liked. You know, and nobody else is ever going to see this, but for me, when I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, I wish I could have gone a bit wider on that. I wish, you know, you've got all those kind of little little kind of niggly thoughts where, mm-hmm. you know, next time I'll, you know, maybe go a bit bigger, a bit wider. And um, when you're doing the sound design, you get to put things back. You get to really sit there and craft it and make it really awesome. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think I've got a little bit of an advantage with um, this stuff where because I design things myself like the robot like J1 and J2 like I was I designed those um, mm-hmm. I had um, Callum Watt worked with me as well he chipped in on some of the J2 face stuff and he did J3 as well so it was me and me and Callum uh, Callum I another, another guy I can't believe I got to work with this guy's just amazing um, so when I'm designing something I have this kind of um, because I work in 3D, I do my design in 3D. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of a, um, it kind of feels like playing. It feels like I'm playing with things. And there's an effect that I find I get in my head, which is almost like when I was a kid and you're playing with toy cars and you're kind of hearing the engine noises in your head. Mm-hmm. I have that when I'm working. I know what noises things make. If I design a gun, I know what noise it makes when it fires. If I design a spaceship, I know what noise it's going to make. If it When it breaks a sound barrier, like 10 mm-hmm. feet off the ground, I know that, I know that noise. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I know the noise buttons make when you press them. Like, you know, it's it's the the little sort of playful kid part of my brain. Like when I was playing with my Star Wars figures, yeah. that <laughs> that comes out when I'm designing. So I've already got loads of thoughts on the sound design. Um, and then the kind of deal is like, you know, sit down with a sound designer and I'll tell them what I'm thinking and then see if they've got anything better. And usually just that whole, that whole conversation just ends up being amazing. And Brian... Uh, Brian on this just put in such an amazing turn. But that car noise, that cut, you know the cut over J2's face? And then it cuts to the road and we come up off the yeah. road onto that Lotus. 
I mean, I always wanted that. That's my all time favorite car since I was a little kid. That Lotus Esprit, the original <laughs> model. That's my dream car. So <laughs> when I was having a sci fi car in this film, it had to be that car. And we searched all over Hungary, but we found one. And nice. uh, there was two cars I really wanted in the film. There was I wanted a Lotus Esprit and I wanted a DeLorean. And <laughs> you might not have clocked it. I think you probably have to be a real DeLorean enthusiast to clock the DeLorean in there. But you know the, the conversations in the car, like the flashback conversations. I, I totally clocked noticed it. that that was a yeah, DeLorean yeah. because I have worked <laughs> with those those tiny little windows. That's it, right? It's a titchy window. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like you had a great deal of fun making this movie. Yeah, it was it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. I mean, the thing that I really love about filmmaking is that as an artist, it encompasses all of the arts, right? And I'm mm-hmm. one of those artists that kind of wears a few different hats anyway, probably too many really. I'm always I'm always a little bit um, self-conscious about getting into another area of art because, you know, I always I'd rather be a you know a master of trades than a jack of them, if you know what I mean. Right. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I was originally hesitant to get into the writing process. But in the end, I was like, if I don't get in and write it myself, I'm never going to get my film made. So that's how I became a film writer, just through necessity. Hmm. But, um, you know, working in film, you get all the arts and you get to bring them together in, into a point. You know, so you've got... You've got illustration and concept design. You've got um, music. You've got writing. You've got theater. You know, you've got photography. Like, you've got all these different art forms that you can bring together on into a point for, like, one ultimate effect. And I just think that's brilliant because when you're doing that, it's so much fun to do that. But when you're working with it, all these, like, people, like Laurie Rose, the director of photography, that guy's a song called genius. And, mm. you know, getting to work with him, it's just, I mean, you know, I think anyone who's got to the point where they've made a film will probably feel the same way about this, but you feel really, like, spoiled to be working with people that are very good, you know, because you've been grinding and working your way up over years, and when you eventually get there and you're like, wow, I can't believe these people that are around me right now. Look what's <laughs> yeah. going on. And so I, it was, the whole process was that, you know, I'm sat there, I mean, I have a whole thing with sets anyway. I've experienced this twice now. I had it with Moon and I had it again with Archive. And because I design um, the sets as continuous spaces, you know, you walk inside, close the door, and you just, you're there until you, you know, open the door again and walk back out. So I love sets like that, but I always design the whole thing in 3D. And so when it gets built, it's literally like me being inside my own head um, <laughs> at one to one scale. It's a really strange thing. And I've had that twice now. I had it on Moon and I had it with Archive because it's it's exactly the same as I've designed it and it's just real now. You know, it's mm. it's it's a strange thing. Yeah. But, it must be a satisfying moment too to have whatever's in your head just be there visually in front of you. Yeah, it's super cool. But when you get into the um the actual business of shooting and the days get very, very busy, um I, I have a, a kind of a, a deal with myself where I always kind of try and tell myself to try and enjoy it whilst it's happening. Because mm-hmm. it's a funny thing, like being a filmmaker, you're kind of striving for unemployment. You know, you start making a film and the whole thing you're trying to do is to like finish the film. And as soon as you finish that film, you're unemployed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Um, but, you know, getting back into the, the, the story and everything, you're, you're going to be invested in uh, not only J3, who is the, the quote unquote more human part of this uh, equation, but J1 and J2 as well especially J2, is Stacey Martin doing the voice in that as well? Yeah. And uh, and mm. you've done some sort of like uh, effect there where, you know, it, it sounds just a little bit different, I think, from what J3 sounds like. If I'm if I'm reading that correctly, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No, you are actually. It's this is a, a stroke of genius by a chap called Ben Tatt, who was a dialogue editor. Mm-hmm. And you might think when you're looking at a film production, you might think a dialogue editor's like, you know, it's like firstly, what do they do? Mm-hmm. Secondly, like they can't be that important, can they? What? They're editing dialogue, what does that even mean? Blah blah blah. <laughs> Basically, Ben's job is to go over I mean it's a, it's quite a thankless task. He has to go over the whole film. And he has to check that the audio is solid. And if it isn't solid, if there's like other weird noises going on over lines, those li- lines will need to be ADR and re-recorded. Mm-hmm. And so first of all, that all needs checking and tracking. And then if there is any ADR, we need to make sure we get what we need. Um, but when we were doing all of that, 
um, we had a whole thing about what to do with J2's voice because I wanted to play a little bit and try a couple of things. So we tried a couple of things earlier on, and it felt like there was more we could get from it. So we recorded, we had Stacey doing ADR anyway and recorded a bunch of J2 stuff whilst we had her. And then we, you know, we tried putting some filters on and trying to get something that didn't just. There's a there's a robot voice filter called uh, UVPC pipe, PC <laughs> pipe, and it's just standard filter and it's like a oh, robot voice. We wanted to go a little bit past that if we could. And Ben had the idea of breaking up um, breaking up a voice like a sat nav. So what we did was we recorded each line with her saying it several different ways with the emphasis on different words, and then we chopped it all up and just took bits and pieces of it and put it together. And so you get this kind of stop-start sound, and it kind of sounds like an old, um, an old voice synthesizer almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's quite subtle, but Ben put a lot of work into that, and you know I'm really glad he did. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, that's the thing that uh, about about this is is J 2s journey through this. You're going to be invested in. It's easy. Uh, I, this is what I, I love. Uh, another thing I love about this movie. Uh, Theo James is playing ostens- uh, ostensibly the uh, hero of the story, but he has some really dark, um, uh, you know, edges to him, uh, and it shows in his relationship with J two um, because he's. It seems like he's pretty annoyed with her, but like at the same time. He, he he cares. It's just that it's not what he wants out of this whole thing. He's put a whole conscience basically in this robot and uh and he's ignoring her essentially and, and yelling at her and everything. I think it's a really good touch that you've put in here. Well, the other I mean I'm really it's really gratifying to hear you um talking about this stuff because this is quite a lot of the meat that I was wanting to, to get in there. Um the thing about J one and J two is that they're all shades of the original Jules who died. And so they are all developed to different levels of sophistication. So we've got a six-year-old and a 16-year-old. And the idea is that because they're all shades of his dead wife, they all love him, but they love him in different ways. So because J1 is like a six-year-old, she loves him like – she thinks he's cool, so she kind of loves him like she'd love a dad – so she yeah. just thinks he's this like cool guy that can do no wrong and he always fixes things and you know is stronger you know is this strong guy that just you know is he's like an idealized kind of dad love um but j2 is different because she's like a 16 year old so her love manifests in a crush mm-hmm. and so what oh, yeah. she, what she's going through is basically like a teen crush um and the one thing about the teen crush from um a young girl is he could never know about it like it has to be secret yeah so she can never let him know how how she feels about him and so having that all internalized and then having him doing what he does is that's the thing that that you know that wears it down it's so devastating to see it and and she and and you're talking about that just getting on the cusp of uh you know she can't ever say she gets as close as she can early on in the movie as close as she can possibly express uh, to the, you know, to telling him that, you know what, in fact, I, I am, (laughs) I am this woman that you were in love with in some part. Uh, you just, it's just not enough for you. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just, it's just tough watching, watching her, uh, go through what she has to go through in this. And it's another great element to this because it's easy. I think it's easy for a lot of movies to, to just focus on, Oh, well, he's making this advanced model, and this is the this is the the stake that we're waiting for, and everything, and uh, and even that has its own surprises. But uh, J 2s uh, development through this, uh, I think, is what adds a lot uh, of depth to this movie. Well, I tell you what, right? One of the things that I found really interesting about this whole thing is I wrote this film, and like I was saying before, you know, I wanted it to be about love and death. So, but ultimately it's about connection. It's about human connections and what you would do to, you know, what you would do to get the, get the one back if you could. And what, so I set out to write a film about love and death. And what I ended up doing was accidentally writing a film about replacement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't think that tells you something about 
people in the real world. Like what they really fear. <laughs> it's probably just all my psyche spilling out. I shouldn't be saying this stuff. These are all no, my fears. <laughs> no, it, you've got so many now. levels to this. I mean, you can, uh, the things that I'm very interested in, uh, pre- previous movies like Her and uh, Blade Runner 2049 is what it means to be human, what it means to have an actual consciousness. And you you certainly play on that with, with, with a certain level in this movie because, you know, is J2 human enough uh, for, for her own uh, sake, for her own consciousness? She's obviously not human enough for, uh, for I'm sorry, Theo James, uh, is it um, George? George. Is character name? Yeah. Uh, and then how, how human is, uh, is J3 uh, even before, you know, uh, the ending happens. So, uh, that that always fascinates me. It's at some point, do, does self consciousness, which J two clearly has, make you in a sense as human as a quote normal human? Uh, I think this this movie explores that very very well, especially how um, the J two arc plays out. It's so nice to hear this kind of stuff. Honestly, this is. When you when you sort of I mean okay just consider this right I'd not written a film before and I was I was aware of the fact that I was trying to get into some stuff that would be quite easy to lose do you know what I mean but one of the things mm-hmm. that I was really happy with with the film is the way the film came out it was it was a film it was supposed to be like it didn't morph or change into something else like the original ideas were um, they were all they all came together and solidified very early on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, to to get to the end of the film and have that still be the same thing was really gratifying for me. But then it put me in that awkward position of like the, you get with this inevitable. Like I'm going to put it out there, and if people don't like it, it's entirely my fault. Like this thing is what it was supposed to be. So <laughs> no, if people that's... don't like it, it's me who's wrong. You know, I've just I've got it wrong. <laughs> and it's just and now now we're like nine days away from the film coming out that's like a monkey on my shoulder right now you know so it's really cool <laughs> to hear this kind of stuff i really appreciate that oh no i was i was very pleasantly surprised you know you never it, it, with sci-fi you know we we really love high concept sci-fi um when when you read the premise and you're like uh, i don't know how that's going to work out and the the fact that it's a non-linear structure really adds to the richness of it. And I was, I was just absolutely in, uh, you know, right at the beginning, uh, especially with that, uh, the, the cinematography that you were talking about going over with the drones over the, the landscape and everything. And that house is so cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was designed by a chap called Nick Levy. Well, we designed it. I, when I was doing the concept work, I had Callum um, and Nick, there's just three of us. It's me, Callum and Nick. And um, Nick was dealing with the architecture stuff. So we were, yeah, we were really rolling our sleeves up and getting into that. But he did some fantastic work. Um, Honestly, just being able to, this is what I was talking about, about being able to work with um, high caliber um, artists and like craftspeople. It's like working with an architect. So how nice is that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, I did have another question because I was, I was, uh, you know, running through your IMDb like a stalker. Um, no, uh, I, know what this I, is. I know what this is. Uh, <laughs> you on. do know. You do know. Huh? I can guess what this is. Yeah, go on. Okay. Miscellaneous crew on Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> My secret past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a fun one. That was back in that was ages ago. It was back in two thousand three, I think it was when we were shooting that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a fun little story that happened. Um, I was I was actually running a team outsourcing in the games industry at the time. I was actually doing Grand Theft Auto three at the time. And I was a bit I was a bit burnt out. I was doing the um, vehicles for the Xbox SKU. Um, <clears throat> myself and my old chum Kev Duffy were grinding through that, and I was a bit burnt out. And I I didn't have time to go on holiday. So one of my um, good friends, Ed Traquino, um, comic artist now in the Bronx, he he saw an ad online and it said, do you want to be a zombie in a film? And you know, <laughs> I, I grew up with all the Romero stuff, so I was like, and, and this is back in like 2003-ish, early 2003, maybe late 2002. So it was before the whole zombie thing kind of came back mm-hmm. and zombie films kind of weren't around. 
And so I was like, oh, it sounds pretty cool. So Ed's like, should we do it? Should we do it? I was like, yeah, man, cool. So we went along to an, uh, an audition in a place called the Soho Laundry in Soho. And I'd never been to an audition before any of that stuff. So we went along and we had to shuffle around in a room with like 20 other people in front of a couple <laughs> of people with clipboards at a table. And I was like, I have got this shit. Like, I'm, you know, George Romero, I grew up with that stuff. It's like, what do you want? Do you want Bub? Who do you want? You know, do you want taxi drivers on me? Tell me which one you want. I'll, I'll bring it. And so I'm like shuffling around the room, mixing up my zombies a little bit. And, you know, they let you do it for like two or three minutes. And then they kind of ask everybody to stop. And you're in a silent room just shuffling around. But I was like, I was so into it. And... um they, you know, they, they, they basically go, yeah, you, 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 everybody else go. So I got in and I was like, yeah, I'm a zombie. So I didn't know what it was. And I was a huge fan of Spaced. And mm-hmm. as it happens, um, I had a, a bit of a weird relationship with that show because the character in the show is like, a, um, is like an aspiring comic artist, which is what I was at the time. Like I originally was a comic artist. And <clears throat> I also look a lot like Simon Pegg, and I even had bleach blonde hair circumstantially at the time. <laughs> and it turned out later on, and we even drove the same car. We both had like MX-5 Model 1s. Um, but what happened was I went along to be a zombie, did four days and night shoots at New Cross. Um, and that, and then when we got there, we didn't know what it was, and we were getting zombied up and shuffling around. And we saw it, it's like, oh, it's the space guys. Um, you know, we, nobody knew anything about Sean and Dad. It hadn't been announced. And we were like, oh, cool, it's the, the guys from Space to making a zombie film. How cool is that? <laughs> um, so we did all the night shoots, and then I ended up getting pulled in. I got pulled out of the crowd by one of the, um, I don't know, somebody who was working on the production. And they said, um, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we're shooting down in Ealing. Would you um, like to come and be Simon's double? Oh, oh wow. wow. So I was like, you don't have to ask me twice for that. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's totally fine. So I did that and went down to Ealing and spent, yeah, spent a couple of weeks, did all the, um, you know, the, the stuff at the end of the film when the, the pub gets um, all the zombies smashed away into the pub and it all goes on fire and they're shooting yeah. and stuff, all that stuff. Fantastic. I had a bit where, you know, when his mum dies um, mm-hmm. and he has to shoot his mum, I had like two days where I had to like cuddle um, the actress Penelope Winton, who's like a, a very beloved UK actress that goes back a long <laughs> way. I just spent like two days like cuddling her on the floor whilst we were all getting <laughs> It was awesome. I was loving it. I imagine so. That's a, that's one of those, uh, that's a, a wholly unique experience we don't hear very often uh, about being a stand in and, you know, <laughs> things like so that. Cool. Yeah, it's got to be. Uh, uh, was that was there anything in that that just it, did that sort of make you want to do movies more after that or were, was it sort of uh, was it sort of a developing process from there well, or were you already deeply into it at that point? We were me and Duncan were I mean I was living with Duncan at this point and mm-hmm. we were already trying to make our own films and I was basically coming home and telling him everything that happened that day mm-hmm. and yeah. my big takeaway from it I mean you know the space guys are just great um, mm-hmm. I love those guys I love Edgar's work so much he's He's one of the kind. He's, he's mm, great. Yeah, same here. But the whole thing was a real demis. Again, it was a demystifying process for me. And I remember going home and and t- every night I'd be like telling Duncan what happened that day. And I think when that was all going on, Duncan was a bit. He was a bit pissed off at me for being in the middle of a production when he sat at home on the sofa. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't <laughs> yeah. saying well with him. You know these things are like they can rub you up a bit sometimes. <laughs> but I remember just thinking. I remember saying to him like, "There isn't anything going on here that we couldn't." do like we could pull this off if we can get the right people to work with it and pull it off and I, I, I don't mean to i don't sound like i'm demeaning anybody's work here because sean the dead's a masterpiece but i mean the, <laughs> the organization of how a film gets made of how the comings and the goings and stuff of, you know what i mean the the actual business of what happens i remember just saying to duncan like we could we can do all of this it's not like there's there isn't anybody riding unicorns around and waving magic wands to make any of this stuff happen. You know, you some really good people, follow the numbers, make sure you've got enough time and be prepared to not have any sleep for like two months. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And that's just what we did. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do any kind of like uh, more like acting kind of things like that? Cause you're no, also, no, 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 no. yeah, I was about to say no. you're also in moon briefly. Uh, yeah, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not pretty you, for the front of the screen. 
Are you the are you the person that shows up uh, when Sam Rockwell is down in the uh, ship and the rescue team and everything? Yeah, yeah. I am. I'm the on the. You see me on the manifest. I'm the captain of the rescue team. But also oh, okay. at the end, at the end when the hatch opens, when he's in the rover crashed and the hatch opens and the figure comes in with the light, that's me with my paintball gun. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, when we were doing, um, we didn't have any money. When when we were doing Moon as well, we didn't have insurance for stunts. So most of the spaceman, well, every time you see a spaceman and you can't see his face, that's me. Oh, really? <laughs> you were really, really involved in this movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it was, it was me and Duncan making films. It was awesome. Like, yeah. we were just a couple of mates. Just, you know, all of a sudden you're on set and it's like, we don't have any insurance. It might be a bit dangerous. You've got to climb twenty five foot up and you know, get on top of that um on top of that rover at a fifteen degree incline covered in cement dust wearing a spacesuit where you can't look down or feel your own feet. Is that good? <laughs> yeah, sounds no, great. Cool. Um any safety equipment? No. Good luck. <laughs> All right, so Archive comes out on July 10th, and it, it's it's probably digital and streaming, VOD, and that type of stuff. But uh, you're still kind of hoping, crossing your fingers, that it might uh, hit some theaters as well. Am I right? Well, I mean, you know, it'd be there's a little bit of an ego thing there where you want to be able to say you've got a release in the U.S. I mean, that's the that's the big thing. But mm-hmm. at the same time, what I really want is for people to just watch a film and hopefully enjoy it. I mean, I can't ask for much more than that. Yeah. Well, it is awesome, and we have Thank fully you. recommended it uh, to anybody who's listening. Uh, so find a way to watch it. Get it. Get yeah. it in your veins. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so we would like to thank Gavin Rothery for uh, uh, doing an interview with us today. Very kind of you to uh, give us your time. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we're on our usual uh, b- b- social media stuff. If you want to uh, go and comment about this, this is a r- movie well worth seeing. So try to find a way to watch it. Uh, that's going to do it for this interview. It's Chris Atkinson and Barrett Shear. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. And uh, this is a good time for a movie like this to come out. And uh, I assume that it's going to be on digital platforms, correct? Uh, yeah, it would. it would seem so. I mean... It's a bit of a it's a bit of a weird one as a filmmaker because we're currently like staring down the barrel of the US release, right? It's the tenth mm. of July um when it comes out and it's the first of July now. So basically I'm like, you know, nine days away from dropping my feature film debut, which is brilliant. Mm. And you know, it's supposed to be theatrical. <laughs> it's supposed yeah. to be a full theatrical um launch. And so now it's um it's gonna be hitting streaming because all the theatres are closed. Yeah, and it's it's a kind of a weird one because as a filmmaker, you know, you you got this whole cinema, cinema, cinema thing going on, but everything's just kind of crossing together so nicely these days with streaming, and the quality of the streaming products have got to offer, and also with the kind of home cinema setups people have got, like people have got big TVs, they've got nice speakers, mm. got a fridge full of snacks, they've got a comfortable sofa, you know, I mean, that's pretty good for cinema, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's such a good answer that I'm going to put that at the end of the episode, by the way.